I'm so happy to have the opportunity to do this webinar and share with you all what we've done here in the Commonwealth uh, to advance safer cleaning products, not only in our state, but we have the opportunity to partner with a number of New England states to make this contract happen. So my name is Julia Wolf. I'm the Director of Environmental Purchasing for the Operational Services Division. And I also here, have here today uh, Lana Gunaratna, who is one of our stellar strategic sourcing leads. And um, she's been managing this contract for a number of years. And we thought it would be good to have her go into some of the important management components. So at the Operational Services Division, we do a number of things. We set up statewide contracts for goods and services, which in the Commonwealth, executive agencies are required to use and other agencies, authorities, public uh, educational institutions, municipalities, and some nonprofits are encouraged to use. We have about 120 statewide contracts and approximately, I'd say, $1.4 billion and growing in purchases go through these contracts every year. So here is our agenda. Sorry, let me just... Um, This is not working. There we go. Sorry, the, um, there we go. Um, here's our agenda today. I'm going to review our Environmentally Preferable Products Procurement Program, or known as the EPP program, in addition to our Executive Order 515, which we, um, we're real, it's really the impetus of um, putting this contract together. Then I'm going to discuss the progression of this contract from uh, FAC 59 to the current contract, FAC 85. And sort of just to let you know, all of our contracts have a three-letter suffix before them and then a number next to them to distinguish them from one another. Um, then I'll discuss all of the different entities that help make this happen and we'll review third-party certifications, benefits and results. And then Lana, she's going to discuss some of the contract implementation and management. So we are one of the only states that has a dedicated EPP director. And I just wanted to give you some history about the program. Um, we're actually in our 21st year. We started in the early 90s when the Department of Environmental Protection had a dedicated fund from unclaimed bottle deposits called the Clean Environment Fund. And because their mission was to develop programs and policies to divert waste from disposal to recycling, they wanted to make sure that the Commonwealth was, quote, unquote, closing the loop or um, as well. So, our, so now that's really called um, contributing to the circular economy. So they funded a position at OSD for a few years to advance the purchase of products with recycled content. It was very successful, and OSD eventually incorporated the position into their program. So if we fast forward to 2009, the governor at the time signed Executive Order 515, um, known as Advancing an Environmental Purchasing Policy, which we're still using today. And this policy directs all executive departments to procure EPPs whenever they're readily available, perform to satisfactory standards, and represent the best value to the Commonwealth. And in the Commonwealth, we do best value contracting. So price is not the only factor in our procurements. But Executive Order 515 also provided the ability of the Operational Services Division, <coughs> the EPP program, to mandate environmental specifications. So I work very closely with many of our sourcing teams to identify appropriate, mandatory, and desirable EPP specifications for our contracts. We have over 40 contracts with some type of EPP, and if you're interested, we have a dedicated website with a lot of information, which is listed here, much more than just cleaning products. Um, but we also, um, uh, but what also happened was with, with Executive Order 15 is that there was a greater focus on toxics and products, and a multi-agency toxic use reduction task force was created. And they provided oversight and leadership to Executive Order 515. So they identified cleaning chemicals as a contract category with greener alternatives at work. And if used, could have a significant impact on human health in the surrounding environment. However, the market for these products was still maturing. Prices were higher than conventional cleaning products. 
and there was a lack of education and technical assistance to help buyers transition to green cleaning programs. So the task force, their first recommendation was to create an all green cleaners contract. So as you all know for procurement staff, price, performance, and availability are all important factors when evaluating products. And we needed to get the prices down. We needed to make sure that the products performed as well as or better than non-green products. And we needed to make sure that these products were available in high enough quantities for broad use. So in 2010, OSD uh, reached out to surrounding states with the understanding that success of this contract would be greater by using the purchasing power of multiple state governments to attract vendors into this market. Uh, Connecticut, New York, and Vermont joined. And we developed a sourcing team that included other states, contract users, in addition to technical ex experts. And um, just one point, I think um, New Hampshire also joined as well. As for te technical experts, we had representation from the Department of Public Health, two nonprofits who provided technical assistance to public entities in reducing use of toxics, and one nonprofit that provides health and safety assistance especially in the school settings. So now, a key factor to adopting a green cleaning program is to understand how to, how to use the product. And for instance, cleaners with microbes require cold water, and if water is used, it would kill the microbes and render the product, product useless. The team knew, that, team knew that transitioning to a green cleaning program would require some level of expertise and technical assistance. So the sourcing team incorporated a requirement into the bid that vendors had to be trained on how to use the products, but also needed to be able to offer on-site assessment and recommendations to potential users. In addition, vendors were evaluated for their ability to provide a certain level of training to contract users when requested. The team also developed green specifications for products. They targeted uh, cleaning chemicals, janitorial paper products, and liners. So the sourcing team knew that we had to find a way to make it as easy as possible for buyers or users to, number one, find products that were safer for human health and the environment, and two, find products that worked. So we really can't expect procurement staff to be experts in this area. And if the products didn't work, the contract would fail. So the team decided to use a certification program with an eco-label uh, in order to avoid greenwashing by vendors, but also to ensure products met environmental and health criteria. There are many types of certification programs out there, voluntary certifications, self-certifications, accreditation programs, uh, single attribute pro programs, multi-attribute programs. Um, and third-party certification programs. And you know, these are just sort of to name a few. And the team decided to review third-party multi-attribute certification programs. These types of certifications are developed using an independent third party who has established criteria in an open and transparent manner, and they review the manufacturing process of a product and independently determines that the final product complies with specific standards for safety, quality, and performance. All the procurement staff person would need to know is that the product was certified. So in 2010, the team chose, after actually some significant review, to specify the use of Green Seal and Eco Logo. Those were the third party certifiers. For procurement staff and buyers, they would know that the product with these certifications would have verified green claims and would be tested to work as well as the top conventional brands in the category. In addition, it would eliminate the need to analyze data sheets and um, cost of disposing of hazardous substances. The resulting contract was an all green contract, a quote unquote one stop shop for green cleaning products. It had 18 vendors, 11 product categories, and a requirement for third-party certifications for cleaning chemicals and janitorial paper products. In addition, the evalu um, in the evaluation process, we actually weighed the ability for a vendor to provide technical uh, assistance very high. And I wasn't part of that evaluation, but I believe it was 20 to 25 points out of 100. 
um, really to make sure that the vendors had the ability to provide assistance. So Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, all executive agencies are required to use this as their primary cleaning product contract. The last year of the contract, we uh, were up to close to 10 million in contract spend. So we felt that was very, um, very good. So now, during the life of the contract, we actually did a few other things that added value. This is for FAC 59. First, there were no third-party certifications for sanitizers and disinfectants. Sanitizers and dis disinfectants are pesticides, and they're hazardous chemicals and should be used with caution. As pesticides, they're regulated by EPA and cannot be labeled green. So sanitizers and disinfectants should only be used in certain circumstances where required by regulation and where deemed essential. The Commonwealth's Toxics Reduction Task Force went through a process and identified criteria for safer sanitizers and disinfectants, and worked with vendors to remove products that, that did not meet the criteria. Products with chlorine bleach, phenols, quaternary, ammonium compounds, in excess of 2%, antimicrobial soaps, and other biocides were not permitted. If any of you would like additional information on this, please contact me separately, um, and this could really be a whole webinar in itself. Um, we also developed what we called an approved products list, and I must give the City of San Francisco the credit here for doing such a list. We took all of the products, listed them by vendor, category, price, and other pertinent information, and put them into a searchable Excel file. This list allows buyers to search for and compare products and pricing from different vendors. In addition, we required uh, cleaning contractors on another one of our statewide contracts, FAC 81, which was for environmentally preferable janitorial services, we required them to only use products that either met the specifications or were listed on the approved products list. So lastly, we worked with the Office of Technical Assistance and Technology and the Toxic Use Reduction Institute's Green Cleaning Lab to develop and put on a series of workshops for state agencies on transitioning to a green cleaning program. These trainings, were review, uh, trainings reviewed the science, the environmental and health case, introduced the contract, and it often had vendors with products to show participants. The Toxic Use Reduction Institute's Green Cleaning Lab was also able to provide a number of site visits and additional hand-holding to state agencies to plan for and execute a green cleaning program. So now we're going to go to 2014, um, and uh, we, uh, the contract was up for rebid. We took the opportunity to improve upon FAC 59 and to develop a more robust contract with, um, uh, into FAC 85. So we used the previous contract, FAC 59, as a model, um, but also used a lot of components of a recently bid green cleaners contract by Washington and Oregon. And I just want to point out that the development of uh, the Washington-Oregon contract was funded in part by NASPO Green Procurement, was uh, funded in part by the NASPO Green Procurement Committee. So uh, we developed a 19-person sourcing team, which is a very large sourcing team, and I'm showing you here the breakdown of the team and who they represent, because I think it's important to understand that we have a number of states represented, Massachusetts agency buyers, a municipality, a number of technical experts, and this is really key for this type of contract whose goal it was to source environmentally preferable products. The sourcing team identified 12 categories of products, again, requiring technical assistance and third-party certifications. So here are the 12 categories listed on the left. Those highlighted in red were new categories or products added um, just uh, uh, in comparison to FAC 59. The team developed 19 pages of in-depth specifications which was an attachment to the bid, not integrated into the bid. And I've included a link to the specifications here. Uh, this includes all the mandatory specifications and desirable criteria per category. And for those of you that put together RFRs, you know that this is some of the most important language. 
uh, we required additional third-party certifications and actually conducted another very in-depth review of Green Seal, UL Eco Logo, and the US EPA Safer Choice Program to see if they met our goals and criteria. And ultimately, we chose once again to include Green Seal and UL Eco Logo for any products within the category. And then we also added the US EPA Safer Choice products, but only for Category 3, specialty products, and, and also Category 8, de-icing and snowmelt products. We also identified prohibited and acceptable active ingredients for sanitizers and disinfectants, which is actually spelled out um, in depth in uh, the specification document. And to stay, to stay current and up to date with the changing and evolving green cleaning industry, a process was established for adding more green cleaning products to FAC 85. This included an alternative approval process for innovative new products which allow the Toxic Use Reduction Task Force to modify and add specs for new and innovative products. I provided a link here to the Toxic Reduction Task Force webpage so you can see the forms we require. Uh, in addition, we made sure to allow vendors the ability to add products a few times per year, making it really a living contract. We have started doing uh, something like this for a few other contracts that we have, providing the ability to bid on kind of an EPP category and keeping it open as a rolling component of the bid to invite new and innovative products. So on average, we were able to negotiate a 20% discount on products for this contract, and we ended up awarding 15 vendors to the contract. As I stated before, the common, uh, the com in the Commonwealth, we conduct a best value contracting, and we thought it would be useful to show you our bid evaluation table, what weights we gave for what criteria by category. So I know there's a lot of information on the slide, but as you can see, price is not the main driving factor here. And for most of the categories, it o it's only a little over a third of the total evaluation score. So now I'm going to take a pause and I'm going to pass it over to Lana, our stellar sourcing lead, to talk a little bit more about contract management. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lana Kuburazna, a strategic sourcing lead at OSD Massachusetts. I manage facilities and vehicles related contracts. It's been great working with Julia on this contract and managing FSCA for the last two years. Um, so I'm looking forward to discussing some of my, our lessons learned and um, other topics with contract management. But I'm going to kick it off with uh, the FAC 85 approved products list. This is our product catalog. The product on this contract um, is based on percent discount per category or subcategory. We allow the vendors to update the catalog twice a year during the winter and summer to ensure that the products in the catalog are current and abundant. At contract initiation, we had about 3,300 products, and to date, uh, we have almost 18,000 products. Um, when we update the approved products list, the vendors remove their obsolete products. Uh, they update the MSRPs and add new products. Um, then they submit these changes to us. We then update the changes and verify that the proposed new products meet the required specifications specifications by checking the respective third-party certifier website uh, listed in the uh, FAC 85 mandatory criteria document. Now, has anyone um, tried to review the products on the third-party certifier websites like Green Seal or EcoLogo? Um, so I sure do, and I do it at least twice a year, and this part takes the longest. This is a tedious task because it is a manual process on their website to search and verify a certification. We first filter for the certifications, the, the manufacturers, and then we search through the product names to find what the product, uh, to find the product that the vendor submitted to us. For example, you can see the table at the top with the green heading. Um, this is a screenshot of a product listed on FAC 85 produce approved product list. To find the product in the Green Seal website, see the box number one where you need to first enter the standards, then the manufacturer, which displays the search result, and at which point, see box number two, you will look through the product names to find the item. Um, we require vendors to title their product names on the FAC, um, names on the FAC 85 approved products list just as it appears on the certifier's website. 
to make sure that we have the correct product. Sometimes a, pro a product will be certified for the lavender scent, but maybe not the citrus. So we really have them drill down to the product's ex exact description. Um, so there is room for improvement on the certifier's website and how they list their products. Ideally, we would be able to download an Excel document with the products used and then be able to do a lookup against the vendor products used. Um, and I want to make a note about the SKU numbers. We request manufacturer SKU numbers in our approved products list instead of the vendor SKUs because eventually we hope to use that number to check uh, for the third party certifications. Once we verify that the products meet the appropriate certifications per the FAC 85 product specifications, we allow the additions. If there are any products that do not match the website or criteria, we send the catalog items back to the vendor for update. We typically give them a couple of attempts to accurately update the product. Thus, the products on the FAC 85 approved products list have been vetted and meet the contract specifications. Okay, so um, a little bit about the vendors and buyers. Sometimes the vendors check their competitors' offerings and report back to us if there are questions, questionable products, so we find this very useful and kind of a, a checks and balance. Um, so there are 15 vendors on this contract. They are mostly New England-based small size to mid-size companies. They are required to have trained staff that can discuss with buyers the green for new products and methods and provide training if necessary. OSA requires statewide contractors to, uh, contract vendors to submit quarterly sales reports. We review these reports, and if there are errors, we send them back for correction. Through this process, we are able to get great data, and Julia will discuss some of the data from our sales reports momentarily. Um, but first, a little bit about the buyers. Getting the buyers to adopt the FAC 85 products can be challenging because it requires modifying cleaning methods that have been in place for many years. It calls for commitment from the procurement staff, facility staff, and janitorial staff. Um, executive agencies are required to use FAC 85, so it kind of forces our agencies to uh, adopt green cleaning products. Under FAC 59, for example, we were able to um, provide technical assistance and they proved to be successful. Uh, a great example is one of our state parks under the Department of Conservation uh, that learned about greening products and provided on-site training for their buyers, managers, facility supervisors, and uh, janitorial staff. This was highly effective in the transitioning to all green cleaning programs. The technical assistance is so helpful to make the transition, and it can come in many forms, such as workshops, on-site trainings, demonstrations, and case studies. So, Know your allies. You cannot expect the procurement staff or facility directors to be experts in this area. Engage others in your state, like State Department um, of Environmental Protection, any healthy school networks, or any regional asthma councils, and last, not, last but not least, engage in existing users. Um, the green cleaning movement has to be a group effort. So if you're considering green cleaning products, or you are a public, uh, or a program, and you're a public entity, FAC 85 is available for use by any public entity. I encourage you to use it since it is a blanket contract and established and there are almost 18,000 products. And all you have to do is connect with the vendors to make sure they can uh, provide FAC 85 products to your location. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julia. Great. Thank you, Mona. Um, thanks so much for that great review of current management of the contract and your detail. Um, that was really excellent. So I wanted to go over. Oops, let me change the slide. So I wanted to go over the FAC 85 contract to date. We have six states using the contract, and as Lana just said, any state has the ability to join the contract. So please contact me if you're interested, um, because uh, you know it really depends on whether the vendors service your area. Uh, there are 15 vendors, and I just wanted to take a moment here to say that we received. 35 bids on this contract when we bid it out. And we were really surprised and very pleased with the bidder pool. This was an extremely difficult bid. <laughs> and getting 35 bidders showed us that the industry was accepting and moving towards cleaner products. So um, you know, we have over 17,000, close to 18,000 products available. And sales for 2016 was over 12.5 million. So it just keeps increasing every year. Uh, this is a one-stop shop contract for all green cleaning products and equipment. 
and supplies. And we have lots of resources on our EPP Green Cleaning webpage. And I've included a link here um, as well uh, to that webpage. And also, I just wanted to point out that in Massachusetts, we have successfully transitioned a number of agencies to green cleaning programs. Over 100 facilities at the Department of Conservation and Recreation, as Lana um, pointed out, and 12 of the Department of Transportation depots um, have made, uh, we've also made headway um, at the Municipal Bay Transit Authority, or here in Massachusetts, known as the T. Um, and we've been working with a number of groups at the local health department level on issues related to safer sanitizers and dis disinfectants. So I'm not going to go into all the detail on this slide, but thought it's really important to list some of the demonstrated benefits using this contract. We all know that it's very important to have measurable benefits, especially with green products. Benefits are listed here under health and safety, environment, and savings. And I'm just going to point out a few things. Under the health and safety, um, under health and safety, we, we require on this contract automatic dispensing system, systems that use concentrated product to dispense only what is needed. This equipment limits exposure to chemicals by cleaning staff, and it reduces overuse of product. So uh, really, it's no more glug-glugging of, uh, of these products. Um, environmental benefits include a number of estimated reductions in water use and hazardous materials. And lastly, we see savings an average of 20% off manufactured suggested retail price negotiated into the contract, and also savings from reducing the number of products um, uh, uh, to purchasing one or two products. So many facilities, they use a number of different products, one product per something they cleaned. And we were able to consolidate that to one or two products um, in concentrated versions and they would use it at different dilution rates. Um, in addition, using automatic dispensing systems to only dispense that what is needed, um, using disinfectants only where needed, and using chemical-free options, such as steam cleaning, which may have an upfront cost for the equipment, but significant return on investment from not using chemicals. So that really sort of sums up our um, uh, FAC 85 contract. Uh, the two all-green multi-state cleaning products contracts established new criteria for environmentally preferable and healthier products to be used throughout the participating states. Using the purchasing power of multiple states and bringing together a sourcing team with expertise in environmental and health issues Contracts were very successful in enhancing the mar market for high quality, lower cost, environmentally preferable green cleaning products. So once again, we're putting it in a plug. So the national can be used nationally. It's available for any state to use. Um, we have over eight, you know, almost 18,000 uh, 18, products available today. And we have a process for adding new and innovative products to this ever-changing green cleaning product landscape. We developed mandatory specifications and desirable criteria that are a model for anyone sourcing green cleaning products. So you can always use our specifications if, if interested or work off of them. So I just wanted to um, conclude with some of the next steps. Um, you know, Lana did talk about third-party certifiers, and um, we are really working hard to get the stock keeping unit number or the SKU of the product um, in our reporting. If we can all move together to ask that third-party certifiers include that manufacturer's stock keeping unit number, it's going to be so much easier to, to check. Um, whether a product is actually um, certified. Uh, the vendors need to know that you're reviewing the data. Spot check, and if not correct, send back to them <laughs> to correct it. So after a few times, they usually get it right. Um, make sure that you have a system that allows for including new products and reviewing the specs. 
this will really encourage innovation in this ever-changing marketplace and as lana said, know your allies. you can't expect procurement staff to be experts in this area so requiring vendors to provide some level of ta is great but engaging others like your dep or healthy schools network, regional asthma coalition um, and existing users if you can write up a case study and share it with other state users you, they're really going to be your best marketing um, is going to be from, from the folks that are already using it. So thank you very much for your time and your interest in this contract. And if you would like to get in touch with either Lana or myself, our contact information is listed here. And um, so Jordan, um, I guess we'll open it up, uh, open up the floor for questions if anybody has any. And uh, yes. Yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. So if anybody has any questions, just a reminder, you can unmute your phone by dialing star six and you can you can ask it through the phone or you can type questions into the chat box and I'll I'll ask them as well. Okay, well while we're waiting I actually have a, a couple of questions here. So Julia, uh, I was curious, looking back now, is there anything that you all would have done differently when you were setting this up from the beginning? Um, from the beginning, yeah, I mean, I think I was, I was trying to, we were trying to describe sort of how we collect information. Um, and that really progressed from FAC 59 to 85. Um, so the type of information that we collect from the vendors I think we have a pretty good vendor report now, um, which I'm happy to share with folks. But it was sort of, you know, along the way as we were looking at the information, we realized, oh, we didn't have this information, we didn't have that information. So um, now our, our vendor reports are, are much better. Um, and I think, um, you know, as Lana said, just going back and, you know, sending back that vendor report when we don't get the information that we need, you send it back and you make them do it again because they hate it. They hate it when you do that, but they will make it better. Um, they will give you the information that you need eventually. Um, other things, not really sure. I think, uh, yeah, nothing jumps out at me at the top of, top of my head. Okay, great. Um, so we've got a question here. It says, could you explain further how you came up with the scoring system for the vendor's bids? Sure. And why don't I, um, let's see if I can go back to that slide. Bear with me. So we have in Massachusetts, there are a number of different things that we look at. Um, so for example, um, for supplier diversity, uh, we are required in our contracts to have 10% of, um, uh, of this be for supplier diversity. So if it's, a, it's 100 points, um, our evaluation criteria puts 10 points for supplier diversity. So there's some things that are required. Um, and so in this, in this um, bid evaluation, we had um, an environmental plan, which um, actually is an addition to our request for responses. And it's actually called a current environmental practices form. Now we've changed the name since then. And what, what the point of the environmental plan um, or the current environmental practices form is really to ask vendors about their practices um, with the point that we want vendors that are, you know, um, really thinking about sustainability in their business practices at their facility. Um, so that environmental plan form, um, it's usually up to 5%, sometimes 10% of the evaluation criteria. It really depends on the sourcing team and how important it is. Um, so we have their supplier diversity plan. We have a prompt pay discount. Um, so if they give us a really good prompt pay discount, we had a certain number of uh, uh, you know points that we would give. 
um, references. We actually opted here not to, um, uh, to evaluate. We looked at the references, but we didn't give any points for it. Um, and price, as you can see, it really varied uh, for multiple discounts, price for multiple manufacturer discounts. Um, and then the price in the market basket, that varied anywhere from 35% to 50%, um, depending on the category. Um, we had, you know, if you did categories one through four together, so we really wanted a vendor that could provide cleaning products and floor products and sanitizers, disinfectants, and specialty products all together. We wanted, we, we wanted that, so we, we put some weight on that as well. Um, you know, then we have warranties, um, repair value add-ons, uh, dock delivery. So there's a whole bunch of stuff here, return policy. Um, and the way that we did this is the sourcing team discussed each of these. Um, and, you know, we had folks that were, were the purchasers, and they really, you know, said, oh, I think this is really important. Let's give it a certain amount of points. So it, it, was, it was really a group effort to determine how many points we were giving on what criteria per category. So you can see that this was very complicated. <laughs> and it was very complicated to actually, you know, to do the evaluation but we didn't really know how um, this was sort of the, the, what we came up with. And maybe if we did it again from your previous question, Jordan, that um, maybe we would have figured out a little bit more of a streamlined way of um, evaluating the bid. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think it does. Great. Um, so we got another question here. It says, now that the list of products has grown to a much larger number than when the contract initially started, do you think there would be a cost savings in limiting how many products might be added during the life of the contract? Do you want to answer that? Sorry, we were just um, discussing amongst ourselves for a minute. Um, there may be. I mean, I think the variety is really important. I'm noticing that folks are more willing to look through the products and have, when have, there's more options. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as cost savings from a volume of products, um, I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. sure how that would equate. Yeah, and I think, you know, going forward, you know, when we developed our market basket um, for this, this contract and for those of you that work with the market baskets, um, and I'll just describe what that is, just in case you don't, because some procurement folks don't. Um, the market basket, you attempt to get the highest purchased items and, um, and get the best, you know, give us your best price for, for the products that are in the sort of market basket. Um, typically, in market baskets, you're not going to see a whole lot of green products. And that's actually one huge recommendation to all you know, states is to, if you are doing market baskets, make sure that you're getting some green pro throw green products in there. Even if they don't make it to that market basket, at least you're going to drive down the cost for that green product. So make sure your market basket has equivalent green products in there to the conventional ones. Um, but, you know, if, when we rebid this, that may be a strategy to identify what has been purchased and how can we even get that cost down more. Um, for for certain products, um, and you know we have eighteen thousand products, and maybe their you know stuff isn't used, and we can kind of throw it back to the vendors. Like, do you really need this on contract? Um, but we have you know the vendors really pushed to put a lot of products on there, um, and we really wanted to get as as many products so there's enough variety on there because this is uh, equipment. It's it's cleaning products, products, equipment, um, and supplies. So, you know, it really covers a lot of things. I mean, um, there are hundreds of vacuums on there. <laughs> there are hundreds of, of, of mats, you know, um, and uh, we just didn't feel that we could limit that um, for, it, for it being the first, you know, 
being the first, but I think in the future that will definitely be a question that comes up in a rebid. All right, thank you. Um, so another question here says, do the states have other contracts that offer cleaning supplies? And if yes, how do you encourage agencies to use the green contract? Good question. So we, um, so bleach is a huge issue. Um, and we have not been able to take bleach off of our uh, other contracts. Um, we are working right now very closely, as I said, with the Department of Public Health uh, to try and identify, you know, right now when a local Board of Health inspector goes to a facility, they are usually using a chlorine test strip to test for disinfection. And we are really trying to get these local Boards of Health um, to accept uh, alternative test strips because really they just need to test that the EPA, you know, registered pesticide or product is, it has been used and that's how they test for disinfection. Um, so we, but we, you know, we just haven't been able to get uh, 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 bleach off so it's actually offered on some of our other contracts. Um, and, uh, but with our maintenance repair and operations contract, we did allow vendors to offer products, but they had to meet the specifications um, for almost all of the categories here, except for the sanitizers and disinfectants. So we, we put that as a clause um, in some of our other contracts. We also have um, a hospital contract uh, with hospital sort of grade items. Um, and there are, you know, certain types of cleaning products on there. We haven't, we haven't really forayed yet into the hospital sector, although there have been, there's a lot of work um, in the hospital sector, you know, um, for environmentally preferable products. Um, but that's another contract that we haven't sort of touched at this point. Great, thank you. So um, another question. I know you mentioned the, the market basket a little bit, but what advice do you have for other states that may be looking to create their own green um, products contracts? Yeah, so, so first of all, you know, take a look at the specifications that we developed. Um, I can't tell you how useful those 19 pages have been. They are so useful because vendors will come back to us and say, oh, can't we do this? And we'd say, check the specs. If it meets the spec, then you can put it in. If it doesn't, you can't. Or if it's some type of alternative that you believe is environmentally preferable, go ahead and submit it to the Toxic Reduction Task Force for review if it doesn't fit into any of these categories. So, um, you know, my, my advice is make sure that your specifications are very clear um, on what is allowed and what is not. Um, I highly recommend using a third-party certification and pointing to that. Um, don't attempt to go through and, you know, evaluate products on your own. It's just, you know, I mean, I'm the director of environmental purchasing. I'm, my background is in environmental stuff, but yeah, I just, it just, it's very time-consuming. Um, it just doesn't make sense. So use third-party certifications um, and, you um, in your market basket, you know, some, there are um, some contracts you may be able to have two market baskets. And we actually did that with our office products. We had sort of the conventional items, and then we had a green market basket. Um, so we were able to get green products on contract, um, and they were just sort of separate. Um, so you can have a, you know, sort of conventional and green products. Um, but this, this one was all green products, so we really wanted to make sure that it was a no-brainer for folks. Um, if they used it, they could be assured that everything on this contract was what met the specifications that we determined um, as being environmentally preferable. So really t takes out the, uh, the questions, you know, of what, what, oh, is this environmentally, and the greenwashing. That's, 
you know, the, the, the other big point. I see often vendors will say, oh, it's environmentally friendly. And to me, that means nothing. I don't know what environmentally friendly means. Um, I, you know, I don't like that term because it doesn't, it doesn't tell me what actually that product is doing. So whenever somebody, a vendor sends me something that says it's environmentally friendly, I send it back and tell them that they have to be more specific. Um, so, so the specifications, make sure you're getting green products in that market basket. Um, you know, if you want an all green cleaners contract, you know, um, make sure that you have really good specs. Um, you can consider doing, you know, sort of a, a green market basket um, and making sure to get stuff on there. The other thing is, as I said in the presentation, reach out and get those tech, technical experts on your team. They will be able to go through stuff and they advocate and they also um, can be part of your outreach. Um, you know, so for schools, you know, a couple of the, of, of the technical experts that we had on our sourcing team, very involved in working with schools. And, you know, they just, they turned around and advocated for, for schools who aren't required to use our contracts, but they advocated and said, listen, the state has put together this all green contract. You know, a lot of schools are really looking to, um, looking at what's going in to our schools and the toxic materials and trying to get those out. So this was a real easy sort of no-brainer for them to say, hey, you, you guys should really consider using the statewide contract. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Maybe there's another one. Oh, yeah. Um, so I would add to Julia and say that you want to make sure that your contract's a living contract. Um, there's, this is such a new industry. There's so many new products, um, different kinds of innovative technologies that come through. You don't want to kind of you don't want to leave your market basket or your product list stagnant. Yeah. Um, you want it to be um, you want to be flexible with how you uh, swap in products and swap out. So um, I would encourage uh, living contracts. Great. Great. Thank you both. Um, so, is there a, a link to your specs in the in the PowerPoint, or could we could we get a copy of those? Yes, there is a link in the um, in the um, the PowerPoint. Also, if you just go to mass.gov uh, forward slash ETP, um, right on the front page. And actually, I'm going to just show this to you because I think I listed it here. Hold on a second. Okay. Yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you the, there we go. Hold on a second. So right here, um, right on the, if you look at the, our website, that's the EPP website. And the third graphic is um, for our green cleaning web page. And you can click there. There's a whole bunch of resources. And there's actually a link to our specific mandatory specifications and desirable criteria. Um, uh, document. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your willingness to share all that information. I know a lot of people will find that helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so uh, another question that I had is, is how do you think this project addressed the innovation criteria for the Cronin Awards and how did that play into winning the Bronze Award last year? Well, thank you. Um, you know, I think that part of this is, you know, the fact that we really had sort of this living contract. Um, and I think this is, you know, somewhat of a newer concept is, is really basically saying, you know, here's the contract, but if you're going to have new and innovative stuff, then you can talk to us about it. Environmentally preferable stuff, we will consider adding products to the contract. So that's, I think, very different than many contracts. Um, so that's a one real innovative piece here. Um, I think, too, you know, I, I mean, w when we did FAC 59, we were the first that did the all green cleaners contract. That was really the first time that uh, only all green cleaners contract was, was put together. Um, 
so you know since then Washington and, and Oregon did one and then we came back and sort of uh, made it better you know just made it better for uh, than FAC 59 our previous contract um, with being able to look at the specs that Washington and Oregon did so we really incorporated a lot of stuff that they did but even went beyond um, See, I think uh, the approved products list, even though we didn't, that wasn't our, I, our, our, our idea, that was, you know, something that here, and I think with many states, is sort of new and innovative, putting together some type of approved products list and expanding it to um, other contracts that if you want to use cleaning products, you got to meet the, you know, you have to meet the approved product list, you know, or the specifications that we have. Um, and making our janitorial contract, so our service contract, and making them um, comply with the approved products list as well. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I'm just trying to remember what we wrote in our <laughs> Uh, oh, wow. application. <laughs> but I think that um, those are some of the bullets right there.